Today's first reading is from March the 10th. First reading, 1 Timothy 6 through 10. Of course, there is great gain in godliness combined with contentment. For we brought nothing into the world so that we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with these. But those who want to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many senseless and harm, harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all of evil, and in their eagerness to be rich, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And seeing that he answered them well, he asked Jesus, which commandment is the first of all? And Jesus answered, the first is here, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and with all of your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Then the scribes said to him, You are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one, and besides him there is no other. And to love him with all the heart, and with all the understanding, and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself, this is much more important than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to the scribe, You are not far from the kingdom of God. After that, no one dared to ask Jesus any questions. While Jesus was teaching in the temple, he said, How can the scribes say that the Messiah is the son of David? David himself, by the Holy Spirit, declared, The Lord, is to, the Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. David himself calls him Lord, so how can he be his son? And the large crowd was listening to him with delight. As Jesus taught, he said, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes, to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces, and to have the best seats in the synagogues and places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses, and for the sake of appearance say long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. And Jesus sat down opposite the treasury and watched the crowd putting money into the treasury. Many rich people put in large sums. A poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which are worth a penny. Then he called his disciples and said to them, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all of those who, contribute, who are contributing to the treasury. For all of them have contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Grace and peace to you from God and our Savior Jesus. Amen. Family, health, friends, education, work, wealth, faith. What is of utmost importance to you? In the 2023 Gallup poll, the list was the following. Family, health, work came before friends. Money came before religion. Leisure time and hobbies came before community activities. Through the decades, things have shifted from Yes, family, health, and friends have always been near the top three. But now we have work over friends. Religion had, had normally been the fourth. Now it's fifth below money. And personal wants come over community wants. We continue our message series for our Lent season of discipleship. Our gospel reading has five categories to consider. Education and faith, power, prestige, and privilege, and wealth. I put prestige and privilege together. 
And our reading begins with the greatest commandment. Love God, love your neighbor. It's a combination of the Jewish Shema prayer that is found in Deuteronomy 6 and the other prayer found in Leviticus, or the law in Leviticus, of love your neighbor as yourself in chapter 19. God not only desires your love, but wants us to live out that love with our neighbors. Femi Perkins' commentary on Mark, she writes that the comment that love of God and love of neighbor take precedence over the sacrificial cult echoes prophetic complaints against those who pay careful attention to ritual while ignoring justice. We can have the airs of being faithful to God, but God calls us to look out for our neighbors. Mark acknowledges that the Christian community can can fulfill the will of God as expressed in the commandments without participating in the Jewish cult. This emphasis on the priority of the love command over sacrifices parallels Jesus' earlier insistence that purity is determined by what is in a person's heart, not any external ritual. The great commandment contains three key elements of the Christian faith. Belief in God, wholehearted devotion to God, not a part of your heart, but all of your heart. Not a part of your mind, but all of your mind. And love of neighbor. We might ask whether we have not given in to another kind of polytheism. A casual pluralism, we allow good things that are not ultimate to become the ultimate. And defining forces in our lives. In our readings today, it's intellectualism, power, position, and pleasure, and greed. These are the themes of the four stories found in our gospel readings. And I have known people who were each distracted by one of these. Intellectualism. The exchange between Jesus and the scribe is not all bad. It becomes itself something of an illustration of the great commandment. Even though the exchange occurs in the middle of a dispute, a running argument between Jesus and the representatives of the parties and leaders of the religious establishment, Jesus and the scribes are able to transcend the party strife and cross the dividing line of hostility to confess a common faith because they join together in the conviction that there is no commandment greater than love your God and love your neighbor. They are able to treat each other as neighbors. Both the scribe and Jesus have stepped away from the us versus them categories. Their mutual affirmation is an island of reconciliation in a sea of hostility. The scribe recognized Jesus as the great teacher. Jesus recognizes the scribe as a pilgrim moving toward the kingdom. Their common devotion to God and neighbor silenced the debate. After no one dared to ask him any more questions. I have a high school classmate that I spar with occasionally concerning intellect and faith. He's like, Rob, you're too smart to believe in that stuff. He's one of the smartest people I know. He's built a couple of businesses. His one lack is an understanding of faith. Much like the scribe who's close to the kingdom, I've participated in some of his social media conversations and they slide, when they slide into the spiritual realm. And often, another in the discourse will attack me for how I understand the world. And it's my friend, my, my friend from high school, who will come back and defend and say, I don't understand why he believes in God, but don't attack him. He's one of the few good ones who actually lives what, religion tells us to, of love, of neighbor. Power is found in the King David conversation. The Jewish people were looking for a Davidic Messiah, a great warrior to conquer the occupying army. Jesus, identified, I, Jesus identity cannot be defined by expectations of those who seek such who claimed that he would be an agent of political salvation for their cause. Jesus consistently points back to God as the origin of his message and ministry. Side note, the Jewish people did lead a, devo- lead a revolt 
and occupied Jerusalem in 66 AD, initiating the first Roman Jewish war in 70 AD. The Romans claimed Jerusalem and destroyed the second temple, which is which had been built by King Herod the Great in 19 BC before Christ, with only a portion of the western wall remaining, still standing today. We continue to see this played out in the world, within our nation, within our community. When people use religion to divide and attack, whether it's between Israel and Palestine, Islamic-Sunni Shia battles, Ireland split still between the Republic of Ireland and predominantly Catholic and the Northern Ireland, predominantly Protestant, here in our own country. I knew a camp counselor who questioned my faith because I refused to, make, to call the United States a Christian nation. I agree with the theologian Perkins. Jesus' identity cannot be claimed for any political side. And concerning the warning of the scribe, many religious leaders still today take on the trappings of wealth and power. It says they sit at the best seats in the synagogue. I'm in the front row up here because nobody else wants to sit here. (laughs) And they wear long robes and they want to be recognized in the marketplace, but I simply go by Rob. I just heard at our council retreat one of our council members say that she was talking about me, and her, her father said, wait a minute, who's Rob? Well, that's our pastor. Oh, that's so disrespectful to call him Rob. She goes, no, that's what he encourages us to do. And then she explained why, and the father said, well, that, that makes sense, that we're all in this together. But the scribes, the religious leaders of that day were upset that Jesus would call them out for not caring about God's truth nor concern for the people. The religious leaders should be the defenders of the widow, the oppressed, the orphaned, the poor, and against the agents of destruction. Jesus adds the warning that those who are in positions to help and do not will suffer the worst consequences. Many knowing full well that they are simply masking what they are doing for themselves and are not doing it for others. I try not to judge, but there are celebrity pastors. And then Jesus did identify one that was living within the kingdom. It all comes down to that last story concerning the poor widow's offering. She gives out her livelihood. It is similar to the widow who tended to the prophet Elijah, using the last of her flour to feed him. And as Elijah promised, the flour did not run out. Jesus said, truly I tell you, the poor widow has put more in than all those who are contributing to the treasury. For all of them contributed out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty has put in everything she had. All she had to live on. All of her heart. All of her soul. All of her mind. All of her strength. I've known a number of women who were childless, never married or widowed, who were the main character of that poor widow in our time. St. Luke's has the phase fund created by Peter and Holly Anderson so all youth and junior and senior high students can have social experiences within the St. Luke's church. I was at another church that didn't have such a fund and an associate pastor was trying to create it. There was an argument between the associate pastor and the senior pastor and the treasurer of the church. And this older woman was at the front desk listening to the argument. She lived a very simple life. She never had much money. But the next time she came into church, she went directly to the senior pastor and said, here is a check to start a youth scholarship fund. And if you don't use it for that, then don't take it. She saw all of the children as her own, having none but every child in that church. She considered her child. In all of these stories, there is only only one thing eternal, devotion to God. All the others are temporary. 
our intellect, our power, our glory, seeking to hold on to our riches. And Paul wrote to Timothy, For we brought nothing into the world so that we can take nothing out of it. A few verses later, I personalized Paul's conclusion to his letter. God richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. We are to do good, to be rich in good works, generous and ready to share, thus storing up for ourselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future so that we may take hold of the life that is really life. May we live what we say we believe with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, all of our strength, loving our neighbors as we love ourselves. In Jesus' name, amen.